The following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome back into another episode of Rising to the Occasion. We're so happy to have you guys here with us. We've got a lot to get to. We're going to talk about Michael Penix Jr. and the Heisman Trophy, uh, the way that it was re- awarded us here. We didn't have Jaden Daniels winning the Heisman. We knew that he was probably going to win, and we discussed that. We figured that he probably was going to be the front runner. And just the pure fact that a lot of the Heisman votes were already in before championship week just kind of leaned towards they didn't really care about championship week. They already made their decision. And so we're going to talk about that. Uh, We're also going to get into the best wide receiver in the land when it comes to college football. We're also going to talk a little bit about the NFL this past week and some of the upsets and crazy endings that happened with that. Uh, And then we're going to get to a lot more. So guys, stick around with us. We're going to talk about all of this. But I'm not alone. I've got my man from Mobile, Alabama. Blake, how you doing, man? What is up, man? Uh, Glad to be on here. I know it's been a minute. Uh, I've been super busy in the holidays and everything, uh, but I'm glad to be on here to talk some college football as it winds down and some NFL as uh, we start getting to the thick of the playoff race, man. Uh, A lot of fun games yesterday, or uh, well, two games yesterday and then uh, Sunday, the thick of things. That was really fun. So, uh, yeah, man, uh, the, the sports scene is uh, is on fire right now. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, looking at everything, too, and it's, you know, we were talking about this, uh, you know, for a while where it, at, towards the end of the season for college football, it's such a sad time. But at the same time, it's so exciting because now we get to look forward to all of these bowl matchups. And, you know, I, I feel like that's one thing. I mean, we can even discuss that, and I'm sure we'll get to it plenty more is just how much different bowl season feels like now that we have nil and Mm -hmm. you know guys declaring for the draft earlier than we've ever seen before and you know there's all kinds of things that kind of go into it or even the transfer portal i think is really kind of hurting some of the bowl games just because you don't have as much of a care but i mean next year if teams don't make it to the 12 team playoff do you think anyone's going to care whatsoever about these bowl games no not for real like I, I mean, to be honest, like you said, I don't think anybody really cares about them now. Like, yeah. I know Hugh Freeze with Auburn making a bowl at six and six. Like, Hugh Freeze, he come out and said, like, I want to win the game, but I'm also like, I'm not one of those coaches that's like super hard during bowl week. So, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, like, if Auburn loses to Maryland in the Music City, like, I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to be bummed, but I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, it's the end of the world, you know. So, I, I just, I don't know. they got to figure a way to kind of spice it up a little bit, you know. Well, for me, huge news for Oklahoma fans because the man himself, Danny Stutzman, coming back, uh, and he, he declared for the draft. So, the fact that he yeah. declared for the draft said, no, never mind. Let's run this back. And I almost wonder if maybe the fact that he got second-team All-American – he didn't really win any big time awards. Like maybe that's an eye opener. Like, man, that kind of hurts. Like, I'm not in it for the uh, for the awards, but the fact that I'm not even considered a first team All American. Like, maybe I need to fix some things. I need to come back and make this right. And then on top of that, I think he's just a competitive dude, and I think he really wants to win. But then on top of that, Billy Bowman, who he came in into the, this season, six interceptions on the season, three of those in inter- a pick six, and then. Uh, on, on top of that, like 238 yards, I think it was, of total return yards on those interceptions. That's absolutely insane how he wasn't brought up and, and, and given the award. Uh, and I'm forgetting what award that is. But uh, it's even an award that's sponsored by a, a business that's out of Oklahoma, which was even crazier. Um, but it's for the best, uh, you know, the best uh, uh, defensive back. And how he didn't win that was kind of beyond me because he had an amazing season. But he's coming back for another year. And they're both going to be playing in the bowl game. So I feel like that says a lot. And then, of course, we get to see our our new era, you know, with the Jackson-Arnold era come to fruition. Uh, best of luck to, to Dylan Gabriel. We talked about that, I think, the last show. Uh, how Man, I, I loved him. I loved watching him play. The second he stepped on the field, I was excited to, to see him come to Oklahoma and seeing what he did with Oklahoma and leading us through a really chaotic time. You know, losing your coach the way that Oklahoma did, it's it was almost unprecedented, really. I mean, the way that Lincoln Riley left – and kind of shocked really the entire nation with a winning program and you leave them to go to a losing program. It's kind of unheard of, but uh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for the bowl game. Uh, and I'm a little bummed that we didn't get into a new year's six bowl. Whenever you look at teams like Mizzou or Penn state uh, or Ole Miss getting up there ahead of Oklahoma, 
doesn't seem to add up for me. But yeah, it's it's kind of crazy looking into next year though. I don't think anyone's going to care about any bowl game if you're not in that 12, 12 team playoff. Yeah, I, I'm with you there, and and uh, I think you mispronounced uh, Stutzman's name. Uh, you know, it's communion. <laughs> communion. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's the cracker <laughs> with the juice. <laughs> Man, that, that's it. yeah, that's got to be the greatest. That's got to be the greatest social media post of all time, right? <laughs> Like, oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you know how I feel about that, man. And you brought it to my attention whenever he said that too. And I was like, what are you talking about? We looked it up. I think we were on air when we were, you know, we were recording. And so I'm sitting there looking it up and you were telling me about it. And I was just dying laughing, man. Like, I love that. Um, but yeah. I guess before we get too much further into it, I do want to let everybody know that uh, we, we want to take a time to talk about SeatGeek. That's something special and something that you guys should look into. SeatGeek is an amazing platform, uh, whether you're a fan or of live events, whether it be sports or music or theater, or whatever it may be, you know how challenging it can be to find tickets at a good price and find them easily. And that's where SeatGeek comes in with a seamless mobile experience. SeatGeek allows you to buy and sell tickets in just a couple of taps. It doesn't get any simpler than that. But it gets even better because SeatGeek grades every ticket from red to green based on its value. And it helps you immediately identify the best seats that fit your budget. Plus, every purchase is fully guaranteed, so you can stop. Uh, you can you can shop with with SeatGeek and shop for those tickets completely securely and with a complete peace of mind, which is absolutely amazing. Because it's really tough whenever you see different scams out there and what they bring to the table and what what kind of fears you might have about buying tickets from some of these scams. SeatGeek is absolutely secure, so you don't have to worry about that. Now, we love SeatGeek so much, and we teamed up with them that we wanted to give you guys an amazing deal for being our listeners and our supporters. So if you go to, over to SeatGeek.com or use the SeatGeek app and use code R2TO at checkout, boom, you'll get 20% off your next ticket purchase. That's right. Just download the SeatGeek app or go to SeatGeek.com and pick out those perfect tickets and enter the promo code R2TO. For an awesome $20 off. You can see that down below. It's also in the description. So if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, you can go down there and see that. That's R2TO for $20 off. SeatGeek Life is an event, and we have your tickets. Now, let's get back to the action and get back to some of the sports and everything that's going on. Because, man, first starting off, we haven't been able to talk about the Heisman yet and the selection that was actually made. Now, we kind of made our predictions. I forgot to get the graphic out. I didn't get that out in time. So it was kind of null by the time that I was ready to get it out. But we all had Michael Penix as our favorite to win the Heisman. We all kind of talked about it. We were talking in our group chat that it just seems like it's leaning towards Jaden Daniels. And I figured he would because he does have some amazing stats. But I kind of want to run through this real quick uh, just to kind of get, shine a little light on the matter because everyone's acting as if Penix didn't have the stats that Jaden Daniels did. But with Michael Penix Jr., he had 4,218 passing yards, which was number one in college football. He went a perfect 13-0 and record, and that was 11 Power 5 opponents. So I mean, that's one thing, and I think that's something that needs to be brought up when you're talking about the Heisman. I don't think the record means everything, but that does mean something, and especially when you're going against 11 Power 5 opponents out of those 13. 5-0 against ranked opponents. That absolutely means something in a Heisman race. He won his conference championship. I think that means quite a bit in the Heisman race, too. Uh, and we'll talk about that here in just, in just a minute. He also led six game-winning clinching drives. And I know they were down to the wire in some of these, these games, but he led those. That's Heisman moments. That's something that a Heisman winner needs. Uh, and then he also beat the former Heisman favorite, Bo Nix, twice. Because there was twice that he was a, a leader in the Heisman polls. And he dropped down because Penix beat him both times. Uh, and so looking at that, I think that's something very notable to bring out. Uh, and he had Heisman moments against USC and Oregon, I think, were the two biggest Heisman moments, moments for him being able to win the game, especially the first time against Oregon, where he's able to lead them down and score real quick. Mm -hmm. Now, you look over at, at Jaden Daniels compared to Michael Penix's 4,218 yards. Uh, Jaden Daniels had 3,812 passing yards. That's number three uh, in, in college football. Uh, nine and three record. Never ranked in the college football play playoff top 12. And I know that's not completely in his control. And so I'm not holding that completely against him. And I don't think that's the complete reason why I don't like him winning it over Penix. Um, but then jumping on as well, one in three versus ranked opponents. I think that says a lot about you as a Heisman contender and your team, how you compare against those ranked opponents. 
uh, one and three compared to Michael Penix's five and zero oh against ranked opponents. Uh, and he finished third in his division. Uh, so not even just in the conference, just in his division in the West alone. Uh, and then he only played nine power five opponents compared to Michael Penix's 11 and really no notable Heisman moments. Because again, whenever it came down to the crunch time, when it mattered the most, I don't really know what moment I pull out and say that was a Heisman moment from Jaden Daniels, other than looking at his stats, which I think you can, you can attribute stats to a lot of things. I don't think stats stands for everything in the Heisman race. Uh, I think a lot of these components that I brought out, those are the reasons why I look at those and compare that. And I think there's other moments that you can bring out. But I, Blake, I just don't look at Jaden Daniels and think he deserved it. Personally, I think Michael Penix Jr. got snubbed at the Heisman Trophy. And it's starting to lose its meaning whenever we just randomly give it out to guys. And like I said, it's not just because he had three losses on his resume. You know, that that's kind of where I, I sit, Josh, is – I, I get why Jaden Daniels won the won the trophy. I, I get it. And I'm not really mad about it. Like, I'm not upset that he won it. Like, he had a hell of a season, you know. Um, but I always took the Heisman Trophy as the award. Yes, it's the best player in college football. But it also has a meaning to it. Everybody says, well, you can lose these games, all right? But Johnny Manziel, he lost two games when he won the Heisman, all right? But he walked into Bryant-Denny Stadium, and he beat Alabama. And he had play after play after play where I said, man, that dude right there, like, that, that, that's the Heisman Trophy winner right there, all right? Um... I get it, man. Jaden's defense was terrible. Like, I understand that. But I still, like, the Heisman always meant to me a guy that raised his team's potential to go undefeated. I'm an Auburn fan, man. Let me tell you something. When Cam Newton won the Heisman Trophy, there was a game where our defense did not show up. It was the Arkansas game. We gave up 40-plus points, all right? We gave up 40-plus points to Arkansas at home, and Cam put 63 up. So if Cam would have lost that game to Arkansas, Auburn doesn't win the Natty. Cam Newton doesn't win the Heisman Trophy that year. they probably give it to somebody else. And, you know, I just think the award has kind of – Kind of lost it a little bit. I, I look, and I'll be honest with you. I don't think a lot of voters uh, watch West Coast games. I think that hurt Michael Penix a lot. Well, like uh, I said, I think it really hurt whenever you saw that a lot of the votes were already put in by the time the championship weekend already rolled around. Like, how do you know who the Heisman winner is when you haven't even seen all of the football games played? And, and that, and that another thing, is just Josh, a, a sign that you just didn't care. You were going to pick Jaden Daniels regardless. And I think a lot of people. I understand the SEC hype, you know, and, and I've I've always been there with you. I like teasing, like I, I teased you in the past before we were coming over to the SEC. I do acknowledge that the SEC is tougher than any other conference as a whole, but that doesn't mean everything when it comes down to everything outside of of, mm -hmm. of the SEC. And that that's that's one of my big things too is. You know, I just feel like the East Coast people, like when Penix played Pac-12 after dark, I don't think they're staying up until 1.30 in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning to watch Pac-12 after dark. Yeah. They're just not. And um, like I said, I'm not mad that Jaden won it because he deserved it. He was He's a great player. Like, well, and, and he did it. But too, is much like we talk about the college football playoff, I think all, the only real way to, to make it fair was to add all six of those teams in. The, the same thing goes with the Heisman. I think you can you can split it up and you can have an argument for any of these guys. I personally feel like you know it, it wasn't given to the guy that deserved it the most. But yeah, I'm right there with you. And, and I do want to I do want to say congratulations to Jaden Daniels. I don't want to cut him down whatsoever because this was this didn't fall on him. He played an outstanding season. I'm right there with you, uh, and, and so I don't want to cut him down in the process. I just I I just personally look at it and I feel like it goes beyond just the stats, the pure stats that mm -hmm. you're putting up. I, I, I'm, I'm with you on that, man. Like, it's also about the leadership to, uh, like, yeah. look, okay, Oregon Oregon in the Pac-12 title game, 
All right, Oregon cuts it to one score. Washington has to have a drive to put Oregon away. And Penix drove down the field. Bang, touchdown. Heisman moment in that game, too, is when Washington needed to drive it down. They didn't want to pass the ball too much. You know, if they didn't have to pass it, they didn't want to. And we talked about this. Michael Penix Jr. ended the season with negative rushing yards. That's just because he's smart and doesn't run the ball because he doesn't want to get injured again. That's a very good thing to do. And when he's that good without having to run the ball, that that's that's a perfect scenario. Um, but, you know, looking at, at Michael Penix in one of those last few drives, I can't remember if it was the last drive for Washington or not, but he took the ball into his own hands and ran the ball for a first down when they needed it a lot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, little, little moments like that, I think there's a lot of big-time Heisman moments. Bo Nix had Heisman moments several times when they were, uh, whenever they were losing there to Washington and they brought it within one score, that was because Bo Nix got to the line and, and threw a dart to his receivers, getting them downfield. Uh, and, and I think looking at, at Bo Nix, I think he had more Heisman moments than Jaden Daniels as a whole. And, and, you know, you look at, at, at the two players and compare them. And the only reason why I don't throw Bo Nix in this, and I don't think he deserved the award was because you lost to, to uh, Michael Penix Jr. twice. And, and that's why, and we, we talked about that on the show, I think I think Michael Penix Jr. jumps ahead of Bo Nix and Jaden Daniels if he w- wins that Pac-12 championship. I think that means too much. Uh, and, and that's exactly what it came down to. And and really, Jaden Daniels' only advantage against Michael Penix was that he had over 1,000 yards rushing where Penix didn't. But Pen- Penix carried his team to a national championship stage. Uh, you know, while Daniels, he kind of racked up the stats that are ultimately worthless if you're not getting your team those victories. Uh, and, and I'll even back up to to a uh, RG3 in the season he had, because if I remember right, he had three or four losses as well when mm-hmm. he won the, the uh, uh, Heisman. He had big-time Heisman moments. I can remember watching him against Oklahoma, and Baylor had never beaten Oklahoma up to that point, never. In the 21 years that they played or something like that, they had never beaten Oklahoma. And RG3 put the team on his back and scored time and time again and just completely shredded that Oklahoma defense, which back then was a pretty decent defense. You know, that was back whenever we still had Bob Stoops and the defense was still mm-hmm. standing up tall. So, you know, seeing that, that you know, I think there's a lot of comparisons when you look at other other Heisman winners who have had had uh, several. Uh, and I'm, I'm trying to think, I think, uh, I don't know why I'm drawing a, a blank. Uh, Bo, uh, he, he had... He had several uh, losses as well, but again, Heisman moments. So you know, and you you can you can make comparisons to several other guys that I think had several losses on the season, and I think they just had those high what we call Heisman moments. And I think everyone who loves the sport of college football, I think you understand what we mean when we say that. Uh, you know, and it's 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 not a hidden term. I had a guy tell me that Jaden doing what he did against all of those teams was his Heisman moment. And I'm just like, like, you know, I, I also had somebody else tell me that we wait, we put too much weight into the Heisman moment. Um, but, you know, like I said, I'm not mad that he won. I think he's a great player. Like, I think he earned it. Um, I don't know, man. It's just hard. Like, I feel bad for Penix too. You know, like I'm on that, I'm on that, that double, that double coin where I, I I'm, a, you know, I'm okay with Jaden, but I feel bad for Penix because I feel like. He was in a championship game, um, and Washington. Let's stop. Stop right now, thinking that Washington's defense is good. All right, because it's not. It's not great. Like, um, I, I would say they're good, not great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not. They're not like. I think. I think Oregon and Washington's defense is what Lincoln Riley needs to emulate. Maybe not now that he's going over to the Big Ten, but it worked perfectly in the Pac-12 because. It's one of those bend but don't break defenses that they're going to let up some points, but they're not going to let up nearly as much as our offense can score. And that's exactly what you need on defense enough to where you're going to bend here and there. You're you're going to bend and give up some field goals and you're going to give up a touchdown here and there, but you're not giving up nearly as much as what your offense is capable of putting up on the board. And I feel like this is going to like if Penix goes out and beats Texas, man, I just feel like you're really going to feel bad for him because it's just like, Dang. Well, yeah. and you know, maybe maybe that's just adding fuel to the fire too. I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm personally picking Texas. I think Texas has a really tough defense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and we'll get to that later on, I'm sure. 
But, you know, as of right now, I'm looking at Texas, and I just I just think they're the better team because of how they've been playing with Quinn Ewers in the game. Mm-hmm. And, and you saw what they did at Oklahoma State, man. Uh, you know, that was that was brutal. <laughs> so, no doubt. I, I'm, 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 I, you know, I, I don't think they do, but I, I think it would be a very sweet moment for Michael Penix. And, you know, I, I think for him, too, I'm sure it hurts a little bit to not win that, that trophy. And that's why I'm, I'm right there with you, man. I just... I, you know, that's why we talk about this because I feel bad that he didn't win it for that reason. But at the same time, I think he's happy that he's on a national stage. He brought his mm-hmm. team to a national stage. That Heisman, you know, being a candidate, being one of the top four guys to go to New York and being the number two guy in the next in line, that still means a lot and that's still a high yeah. honor. Uh, and the fact that he was recognized for being the guy to carry his team there. I think that should mean a lot to him, and I think it does. And I think he's he's fired up, and I think he's ready for these these playoff games. No doubt, a hundred percent agree. And it, I think it might be a good thing that he didn't win it for Washington because of everything that comes after uh, yeah. the Heisman. You have to go to the dinner and the photo shoot and and Good Morning America and all there's of those types. Why there's of a things. thing called the Heisman curse. Yeah, so um, I think it's a good thing for Washington that he yeah. didn't win it. Yeah, I'm right there with you. But another one that I think a lot of LSU fans in particular are complaining about is we talk about the Bolitnikoff Award and the best wide receiver of college football. Who is the best wide receiver in college football? And again, I think a lot of people want to go to stats. They want to look at stats and say, look at this, look at that. And they don't want to break down a wide receiver or, or just a player in general and look at everything he brings to the table. You know, and, and a lot of people want to compare Malik Neighbors' stats. Uh, and, and I think there's some that they – they try bringing up just to just to act as if they're not saying that out of bias um, because a lot of LS, LSU fans, and I'm picking on the LSU fans because they're the ones that I'm hearing complaining about this, but they're complaining that their their guy, Malik Neighbors, didn't win the Bolitnikoff. They're, he's not the best wide receiver in college football because Marvin Harrison Jr. won that award. And personally, I look at that, I think Marvin Harrison Jr., for one, I've talked about it. I think he deserved to go to New York for what he did. There's a lot of guys you can bunch into that group. I think Blake Corm mm-hmm. and some of the things that he did, even though he didn't have the stats that he had last season, I think you, that, that's another guy that you could grump, that you could group into that that bundle. You know, there's several guys, um, but looking at Marvin Harrison Jr., I think he deserved it. I, I think he deserved. It. I don't think he deserved to be number one. I think number four was a perfect spot for him in the Heisman contender. Um, you know, and in, in, in that list, but then we we look at the best wide receiver in all of college football. I don't know how you can argue that it's not Marvin Harrison Jr. And I know a lot of people want to say it's because of his name. His name means a lot because he's been going through through pro training since the day he had a football put in his hands. That's why he is so good. You know, and and I was I had somebody kind of comment on something I said on social media about his route running, and they said, "Well, I wouldn't." I wouldn't label him for his route running. And I was like, well, I didn't mean to label him for his route running, but I think a lot of people look past his route running just because you think that he's just faster and that's why he's getting past the secondary. That's not always the case. You watch his his complete route, and a lot of the reason why he's past the secondary and going deep and he's the deep threat is because he's able to turn them around with little things in his route that you don't really notice from uh, from up, 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 up afar. But when you really look at his route, he's turning his hips in a way that makes it look like he's going out or going in and getting around the defender, getting deep. And there's a lot that goes into his route running. So, no, I wouldn't label him for his route running. I think his ability to high point the ball, his ability to adjust to the ball, uh, you know, and, and then his his speed, I think that those would all come above his route running. But his route running is phenomenal. Uh, and, and I think if you see him at the next level, I think you're going to see his route running come into more of a display and some of the things he can do. But... Personally, I look at him. I think guys like Roma Dunze uh, absolutely deserve to be in that discussion. Uh, and then, you know, there's there's quite a few others that I think can be thrown in there. But those are my top three guys. I, I do think Malik Neighbors is, is an incredible talent. But when you're comparing him to Marvin Harrison Jr., the stats don't say a lot because look at who Marvin Harrison Jr. has had as a quarterback. I don't think Kyle McCord is the greatest quarterback to have come out of o- Ohio State. I, I don't think he was even a top five, top 10 quarterback this season alone, top 15, maybe even 20. You know, he's he's a good quarterback, and I don't want to cut him down. I just don't think he's a great quarterback. And so I think that says a lot. The fact that Marvin Harrison Jr. had less attempts this season and still had the similar uh, similar yardage and similar touchdowns as he did last season, I think that says a lot about him. And personally, I look at Marvin Harrison Jr. 
I, I don't think there was a doubt in my mind that he was the best wide receiver in all of college football. Marvin Harrison Jr. is the best wide receiver in college football. Period. Period. Um, talent wise, whatever we can go to stats or however you want to do it. Um, Malik Neighbors is great. It's going to be a high draft pick. All right. Um, probably going to do probably going to do great things in the NFL. Like, but there's just like when I talk about best, man. When I talk about best. It's Marvin Harrison Jr., and it's not close. It's not. Um, but like I said, you know, you mentioned um, Odunzi from Washington and and a couple more guys I could go around. Like, um, I think Worthy at Texas is great. Yeah. I, I think he can take the top off of a defense. Uh, I think Isaiah Bond, you don't hear a lot about him. I think uh, it, uh, even – Adonai Mitchell, another guy, or uh, yeah. uh, Luther Burden Jr. You know, there, 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 yes. was, there was a lot of wide receivers this year, man. Yeah, I mean, really and and like down. I bring up Isaiah Bond because I just look at the growth at Alabama that he's had throughout the year, and it's it's guys like that, man, where I just like the 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 talent across the country at wide receiver is just so dang good. Look at Troy Franklin and Tez Johnson in Oregon. Uh, both of those guys extremely, extremely good. Um, the USC and their talent at, at wide receiver is just filthy. Um, but when I look at best, man, it's Marvin Harrison Jr. It's not close. Like I don't care about stats. He did it with Kyle McCord this year. Like last year when he had uh, C.J. Stroud, it was it really wasn't close. Um, so you know, I, I think. I think Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to go into the NFL. He's going to have a great career. He's going to put up a lot of stats. He might not – don't freak out if he isn't his dad, you know, because his dad had one of the greatest of all time throwing to him. Uh, but I think he's going to be great, man. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. And a man who's finally able to join us, he was a little late just because he was at work, so we're not cutting him. You know, we're not uh, cutting him down for it, but he's finally able to join us, the man who loves Marvin Harrison Jr., we got Jeremy. Jeremy, how you doing, man? And is Marvin Harrison Jr. the best wide receiver in college football? Give me one, one solid. Give me a solid second, fellas. I'm just oh. now trying to get anything coming on here, but <laughs> maybe maybe he can't get anything going. But once you can hear us, let me know. It's good enough work. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, lo- oh. looking at it honestly, I I don't think there's really much you can say. I mean, outside of it, I think uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. By far, I mean it's it's just hard to argue. And and another thing too, have you seen the kind of money that they're throwing at Marvin Harrison Jr.? Mm-hmm. The kind of yeah, money that, that I guess insane. allegedly is being thrown towards him to keep him there. Yeah, that's insane. Um, it, if you get that kind of money, like how could you turn it down? Because it's more than you would make in the NFL in your rookie season. So yeah, well, and yeah, he's getting stuff, you know, money that would be more. And then on top of that, like you're already a superstar. When it comes, yeah. uh, you know, I, I mean, I just looking at it, man, I don't know. I mean, it's it's crazy. Um, you know, and then you know, some of the numbers that are be thrown being thrown out there. The other other the other thing that kind of worries me if he does end up getting that money, is does that change the game for NIL? In a super bad way, I believe. Yeah. I, I I honestly yeah. I don't I don't like going to the government for anything, you know, especially for stuff like this. I absolutely hate it, but there it, it's it's coming down to it where I think Congress needs to step in and do something because you know I've I've heard some some governors talk about it and some of their their plans of action. I think Ted Cruz is a good guy to look at because he's kind of on that committee that's kind of looking into that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, and it just I think overall, uh, you know, that's that's what it's going to come down to, and that's what sucks is that the NCAA didn't set parameters on. Uh, this nil before just releasing it and just you know here here we go guys you guys can earn money it doesn't matter how much it doesn't matter how you do it uh, none of that stuff so you know it's just it's just kind of crazy when you look at that but I, I think it's going to change it for the worse in a lot of ways and I think it's already kind of getting out of hand with some of the money that you're seeing uh, we, we heard Matt Rule talk about how it costs several million dollars to get a, a guy out of the you know a quarterback out of the transfer portal now you're talking one to two million dollars minimum to get just a, a solid quarterback in from the transfer portal. That's that's insane to me. Mm-hmm. It, it, that's why Auburn – I don't think Auburn goes after a quarterback. Uh, it's just simply because I don't think they want to waste the $1 to $2 million on NIL. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, well, and looking at it too, so I, I know I was kind of teasing around with you 
uh, with, I think it was Cam Ward or somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, who, who's a guy right now that you're looking in the transfer portal that would be good for, for Auburn? Um, I mean, Cam Ward, but it's a one-year rental, and that's why I don't think Auburn I'm, – I'm seeing he's probably going to Miami. It looks like he's yeah. set on Miami, which is kind of uh, funny because I was teasing my dad. My dad hates Miami. He hates him with a passion because of some, some of the history between Nebraska mm-hmm. and Miami. Uh, and so I was teasing him that it looked like Jeff Sims was transferring to Miami as the QB one. And I was like, man, how awesome is that? You get to send your most hated team, your most hated quarterback from Nebraska. You know, <laughs> you guys can go lose. Uh, and then Cam Ward looks like he's going there. Obviously he's going to be the, the QB one mm-hmm. over uh, Jeff Sims. Uh, so that now it looks like Jeff Sims isn't going to Miami, but uh, I mean, who's, who's realistically, I, cause I don't, I don't really know who all Auburn's looking at or, are they I don't really think they are quarterbacks. No, I don't. I don't think they are because I don't think they're. I I don't think they're willing to pay the one to two million dollars to um, get somebody on a one year rental. Like they're not going to pay somebody to play thirteen games, you know, twelve games in a bowl game. Or if they did make the college football playoff, like I just don't think they're going to pay somebody that much money uh, to come in for one year and then leave. Because basically, if you do. And then Peyton Thorne stays. You still have the NIL money that you wrapped up in Peyton Thorne, and I just I, I don't think that's I don't think it's the route Auburn's trying to go. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's crazy too looking at all, all the transfer portal. Uh, I was I was diving deep into the transfer portal today to try to see uh, what do you think about Riley Leonard going over to Notre Dame. Uh, he's a hometown kid for me, man, um, and I'm proud of him. You know, I. I I think it was a good move. Unfortunately, I think Notre Dame's always going to be Notre Dame, um, and and I've said just because like their academic sta- their academic standards are extremely high, and uh, I think they put s- football second at that school, and um, you know which is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, um, but you can tell on Saturdays when they get in big time games. Uh, against an Alabama or a you know a Clemson or something, they're a little outmatched, you know. Um, so, g- a good move for Riley. I, I think it's gonna he's gonna get more exposure. Obviously, he got an NIL package. Uh, he's gonna get more TV time than he did at Duke. He's gonna be on ESPN a little bit more. So, I'm excited for him. But you know, obviously, I think Notre Dame's always gonna be Notre Dame, where they're just kind of you know. 10, 10 and two, and then if they do get in the college football playoff, they're going to get blasted. Well, and I don't think you're ever going to change that until you're in a conference too, and I think that's just the best yeah. move for them ultimately. Like, I think that's going to help you. I mean, I get it; you're making a lot of money, but I think I think moving into a conference can be good for you in several ways, and hopefully, just, the money wouldn't be that much of a difference. Just join the Big Ten. Like, cut the crap, man. Like, come on, just join the Big Ten. USC's coming over. That's a rivalry game. Like, come on, just just do it. Like, you would get to play Ohio State every year. I know the reason why they don't want to do it. Yeah, I, I know they. I know the reason why they don't want to do it is because the, of the greed and all the money that they get to keep to themselves when they do make it to a bowl game and a New Year's Six bowl game and all that stuff. I, I get it. I understand it. But just just join the Big Ten. It don't even join the ACC. Like, because that's stupid no. what they do over there. But. It, well, it is, I feel like they're is. about to crumble too. There's a lot of rumors about FSU trying to go over to the Big Ten, so we'll see. Uh, we'll we'll kind of keep a hold of those rumors for now and see where they actually lead to. I feel like they're just rumors right now. I don't think they're able to get out yet, um, mm-hmm. but it's definitely it's definitely going to be something in the works. I'm sure eventually uh, the ACC. I feel like it's just one of those conferences that's going to crumble. But okay. man, let's get over to the NFL. And I guess before we do, it looks like Jeremy's done with his technical difficulties. Oh. Jeremy, how you doing, man? Doing pretty good. Um, tired, to say the least, but um, I'm here. I'm ready to talk what's left of the sports. Then feels good to have the whole band back together. I haven't seen the father in uh, in a hot minute, to say the least. But um, I'm used to seeing Josh, and it's just me. But it's good to see everybody back again. But boys, what did I miss? Is the real question. Uh, we talked about Heisman, how we felt like uh, Michael Penix got snubbed, and then we also talked about your favorite wide receiver, Marvin Harrison Jr. Is he the best wide receiver in, in college football, without a doubt? Yes. Simple. Say it flat out. Simple. There you go. Let's go ahead and one move on, word, go over one to the line. NFL recap. That's where we can lead off. And I think that's a pretty good pretty good timing for Jeremy to hop into because I know he's a big Bengals fan, a big 
uh, NFL fan and seeing it, uh, kind of talking about one of the teams you don't like. Let's start off with the Ravens. They hang on against the Rams. Uh, they came down to a close one. I believe that one went to overtime, if I remember correctly. I don't have scores pulled up in front of me. Um, but they do end yeah. up beating the Rams. Uh, just a crazy finish to that one. Uh, that's that's a game that you would think that you know the Ravens should have had it. Uh, and it was, it was a full Sunday and Monday full of games like that where it seems like the, the team that should be winning uh, just didn't. And starting off with the Ravens, uh, Jeremy, I mean, what did you think about the Ravens almost losing, which, you know, probably would have been sweet for you to see them lose, but them almost losing there to the Rams? Yeah, it definitely would have been sweet to see the Baltimore Ravens take the L in that one. But, I mean, still at the end of the day, we got to think back to um, how are you really li- realistically going to stop the Baltimore Ravens is in in this perspective. But, I mean, still it was uh, – I didn't get a chance to watch a whole bunch of the game, but it did go into overtime. Then I can't remember the punt returner's name who brought it back to win the game for the Ravens. That was really exciting. It was a really good punt return, obviously, leading into the house. Then it was just one thing to where you see one team – be really competitive than like obviously that for example the Baltimore Ravens now looking on the other side of the ball for the Rams then I know they've had some struggles here in the past but now I mean this is definitely a good sign and showing that they can still play here but I mean you have to play I've said this before you got to play all four quarters to be able to get this done then obviously I know going into overtime it, it just didn't go their way but still I think this is a team that I know there's not a whole bunch of season left but I think that this is a team that you still need to kind of watch out for a little bit. So something that was brought to my attention, it's like a little conspiracy. Uh, and I wish I would have thought ahead to pull this up because we're talking about the Ravens. Um, and I, I, I wish I would have had uh, you know, thought ahead and brought this up so I could show you guys the picture. But if you can uh, either pull up the picture, if you guys are watching, listening, pull up the picture from the 2022 Super Bowl logo uh, and, and think about it. So for those who, who don't have the time to look it up or maybe you're driving, whatever the case. So it was a kind of a, an orangish red like an orangish and then a yellow. And the two teams that played in that Super Bowl were the Bengals and the Rams, orange and yellow. Then you fast forward to 2023 last year. It was kind of like a green, and then there was kind of reds and all of this. You know, there was kind of other colors outside of that too, kind of like this pinkish. It's supposed to look like an Arizona sky because that's where it was at, but there was this kind of green and a red in it. And then we have the Eagles and the Chiefs. And so the conspiracy is you look back at some of these Super Bowl logos and the two colors that are on the logo ends up being two teams with those colors. Now this year we've got purple and then kind of this uh, goldish color to it. So, I mean, does that not kind of lean towards maybe we're feeling like Rams or sorry, the, uh, the Ravens and the Niners. That'd be a good one. That'd be a fun one. I, I, I mean, like if that. you, that if you look at the fun. Super Bowl logos, I mean, I, I saw a video that was, that was brought to my attention uh, and, and see it. So, here, I've, I've got the Super Bowl logo for this year. If, I don't know if you guys can see that very well, like the colors. That's mm-hmm. definitely like Niners mm-hmm. and Ravens colors. I mean, just looking at that, I mean, I was, it was convincing Script. to me. I was like, you know what? It's, it is. It's, it's a conspiracy. And I, I remember last year when I went to the AFC Championship game, we were talking about how, how much I felt like the NFL being rigged feels more like a thing whenever I saw the way that the Chiefs won that game. Uh, and being there in person, it, it thanks for the invite, by the way. But uh, yeah, mm. I just I had to bring that up to rub it into Jeremy's face a little bit more. Um, but <laughs> but uh, guys, let's let's go ahead and move on. I guess mm-hmm. uh, Blake, did you have much on the on the Ravens too? No, I just want to thank Lamar Jackson for dropping thirty eight in fantasy and getting me into the playoffs. <laughs> Appreciate it, man. Man, my uh, our our fantasy over in the belly up fantasy is just atrocious. All the injuries hit, uh, and then we we went against the high low sports guys this week. And it had to. It was literally like an Iowa game because it was the two lowest store, scoring teams. <laughs> they beat us by six, and I think we we scored like ninety two, where everyone else is scoring, you know, one hundred and forty eight. You know, we just had a bad week. Both of us had a yeah. bad week this week, uh, so yeah. they kind of got lucky that we had just as bad of a week as they did this week. But we can jump on because another one that was kind of a surprise. Uh, I talked about this. I think I was over on the Corner Booth podcast with Jared. I think Jeremy, you were there with me too, uh, and we were we were talking to. Jared, it was it was sometime when we were talking to Jared. I, c- I can't remember if it was the one you, you were there with me or not, but uh, we were talking to him about the Bears and the Lions and looking at, at how the Bears kind of have this this sneaky way. They were one of those teams that could sneakily beat the Lions, and sure enough, the Bears end up beating the Lions. Uh, kind of a crazy game when you look at that one. Uh, the Bears actually 
whoop up on the Lions quite a bit, 28 to 13, and the Lions are starting to fall off a cliff. What a team that looked like they could be Super Bowl favorites now really falling off a cliff and, and having some losses here that are hurting them overall in their, their division. Uh, you know, I mean, Blake, we'll start off with you. I, I mean, is this a trend that we're going to keep on seeing with the Lions and then start to kind of muddy up the waters in that division, or do you think they turn it around? Well, the the Lions, they are who we thought they were. Um, <laughs> they're frauds. Uh, and they're, they're frauds because of who is at the quarterback position. That's why they're frauds, all right? Uh, let's don't sugarcoat this. Jared Goff is bad. He is bad, like bad, bad, bad. He's not looking uh, good as of lately. Yeah, uh, dropped him smooth off the fantasy team. You know, I said, hey, after last year, I'm going to take a chance on this guy. Like, he put up big numbers last year. Uh, let's let's see what he's got. And I, I got him off the waiver wire. And I was like, man, this guy, like, when Lamar has a buy, I can just throw golf in there. And then, like, I'll play the matchups. He's been trash, all right? Terrible. Uh, he's turning the ball over at a high clip. Uh, uh Mm, man. Cheeks. Uh, yeah, yeah, buns. Buns. He's been buns. Uh, and their defense, bro. Like, their defense started out playing so well this year. Uh, and then the back end has just kind of – I mean, things have fallen apart, man. Like, um, they couldn't get to Fields the other day. Like, Fields was running around there looking like, you know, he was MVP of the league and, uh, you know – they got some issues, man. They got some things to fix. And I just – that NFC is a little too thick uh, for me and my liking. I, I just don't know where they fit in right now. They're going to make the playoffs. They're going to yeah, make the playoffs definitely. because that division's so bad. Well, and, and but, we were talking about it, Jeremy. Like, with that division, uh, you know, looking at it – I mean, we, we talked about it too. The Green Bay Packers have a slight chance to take over. The Minnesota Vikings have a slight chance to take over. And we were looking at the division like, man – do one of those teams actually jump up? And it looks like, you know, the, the Packers didn't win last night, but the Vikings were able to win, and we'll talk about that game in a moment. Um, but they were able to win, pushing themselves to 7-6, and six, just behind the Detroit Lions at 9-4 and four now. I mean, is is there is it feeling like it could that be that way where now we're going to see the Lions just keep on losing to where the, the Vikings are able to jump ahead of them in the, in the overall standings there in the NFC North? I mean, if they keep playing at that capacity, I, I wouldn't be sincerely surprised. But, I mean, the one, another thing outside of talking about the Lions here, it's, it's mind-boggling to me. How many teams now are 7-6 and six and going into the – going winding up to the end of the year, this is this is definitely going to become the tightest for trying to see who's all going to even be in the playoffs here. But, I mean, talking about Detroit again, just, I mean, going off of what Blake said, if for Jared Goff, I – I wouldn't be trusting him one ounce, just just flat out saying it. But, I mean, for the Minnesota Vikings, I know we briefly talked a little bit about it, Josh, but, I mean, for having Dobbs back at the quarterback position, this is something that the Minnesota Vikings fans and the whole organization is not used to just compared to seeing Kirk Cousins just standing there looking like the Statue of Liberty compared to, uh, compared to Dobbs who's actually – able to use his mobility so i i want i won't honestly be surprised here if the minnesota vikings just come out and they're they're going to be flip-flopping with the detroit and they could easily become playoff contender i i think they're going to make the playoffs but i mean well obviously we still have a little bit of time so i i will see well and jumping over to the vikings game since we're talking about them and, and seeing what they did against the las vegas raiders three quarters no scores we come into the fourth quarter, and it comes down to a minute 57 left on the clock, mm-hmm. and Greg Joseph kicks in the field mm-hmm. goal. Uh, now, Nick Mullins did come in for Josh Dobbs, so hopefully, I don't know what the situation is there, um, but you know, hopefully Dobbs is able to return. But uh, mm-hmm. seeing that, I mean, coming down to the fourth quarter, a minute 57, having to kick a field goal, the Vikings win 3-0. to zero. I don't remember the last time I've seen a score outside of the Iowa Hawkeyes this low. Uh, you know, just, you know, we, we joke about, uh, at least I do. I, I joke all the time about how I love hitting unders on the Iowa Hawkeyes and seeing how low it can get. But I mean, if you put this, this game at, at 10, at, you know, 10 and a half and somebody bet the over, I'd say you were insane. Um, but it ends up coming away with three points. Uh, I mean, is it, is it fun to watch a defensive game like this or is it just two terrible offenses that it's no fun anymore? And let's just get it off the screen. 
I mean, let's be honest, man. The the injuries in the NFL at the quarterback position this year have been uh, through the roof, and uh, I, I feel like the quarterback play has been really bad this year. It has. So, you know, sometimes I'm just kind of like, hey, and <laughs> I mean, this is this is rough to watch. Uh, three to nothing was tough. Um, but you know, that's how, that's how it goes sometimes. And, uh, you know, the Vikings made enough plays to win the game. And, uh, you know, I, I just feel like there's only a certain, there's a small bunch of teams that there's like, like just like a small group that have the ability to win the Super Bowl. Uh, and I just don't see anybody like getting hot and coming from without, you know, from the outside and, um, well, and, and you know, I, I think one of those hot teams that you would see winning the Super Bowl, one of the, the Super Bowl favorites, was the Philadelphia Eagles. But now they've fallen off the face of the planet. They've had two mm. games now where they've been killed by both the 49ers and the Cowboys, both in their divisions, you know, they're in their in their conference, and and trying to beat these two teams, they fall short in both these games. Now they lose by 20 to the Cowboys, 30 to three to 13. I, I mean, are are the Eagles frauds, Jeremy? I wouldn't say frauds. I would just – I don't even know what to really put it as just because of – I don't know, necessarily know if too many people were just relying on the famous tush push or if they had a lot of over-expectation for Jaden Hurts in the backfield here just because after watching after watching last night's game, it just – it didn't look like what we've seen out of Philadelphia the last, the last nine to ten weeks just throughout the season. But, I mean – I wouldn't say fraud, but I don't know if this is just that part of the road where they just have a couple weeks of bad spurts just because obviously we're used to seeing them being undefeated and only have the one loss, and now they have three losses. So I don't I don't think this is an act of fraud, but I think this is just the the spot that everyone has to go to in the season, whether, you, whether you've already gone through it and it just hasn't it hasn't gone away or if you have a team like this and they just now finally start to get that trend going to where you have to realize that okay we actually need to stay back on that positivity train and just keep rolling instead of just thinking we can just easily come in and kick these guys' butts but at the end of the day i mean now you're 10 and 3 when you could be 13 and 0 so that's that's what i really gotta say yeah and really these last two weeks too i mean it's one thing if you lose to two very good teams right now you know looking at the the Niners and the Cowboys, both very good teams in the NFL, and no shame in losing mm -hmm. to them, but losing by double digits to both of them, absolutely getting slaughtered. Uh, what about you, Blake? Do you feel like the Eagles are starting to look a little bit like frauds? Uh, their their defense looks a little fraudulent. Um, yeah. Their secondary is got some holes in it. Um, I've been a little I've been a little weary of them not being able to get Swift going. Uh, their offensive line. Uh, just looking a little shaky, man, and um, them turning the ball over, like Devontae Smith the other night, not being able to hold on to the football. Um, it just – Jalen Hurts being a tick off here lately. Um, I just think that – I'll be honest with you, I think the 49ers are the most complete team in the NFL. Uh, yeah, I've, I've said that even since week one. You know, I know they had that, I think, three-game losing streak or something like that earlier on in the season. But I, I, I think they look the most complete when you look at just the, the stacked on both sides of the ball, the stacked roster that they have. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard to, to beat that. And then just how they play. And, and they come out and they win games big. So, yeah, I mean, that's – it's definitely mm – -hmm. it's it's turned the tide where the Niners are my favorite right now. And even looking at the Chiefs, I think the Chiefs are another team that are kind of starting to look fraudulent. They're not looking very good. Their offense still doesn't look very good. And speaking of the Chiefs, they lose to the Bills – 20 to 17 in kind of a crazy fashion. Uh, they make the comeback play. Travis Kelsey has uh, one of those moments where he probably shouldn't have lateraled. And, and uh, you know, even Andy Reid tells him, don't ever do that again every time he does it. But he loves to do the lateral, throws it back to Kadarius Tony, and scores the touchdown. A amazing play. Um, but then it gets called back because Kadarius Tony lined up about half a foot offside. Uh, I mean, I, I kind of want to hear where you guys come from on this because I think you look at it, I do think he was lined up offside. It's kind of a dumb call to make because half a foot 
and it didn't change the, the trajectory. Him being that far off didn't change the trajectory one whatsoever. Uh, and then there's also another uh, sideline angle that shows him signal over to the ref and then and then line up. Uh, and so that was that was a little skeptical. I, I, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of that one. Um, but overall, I see this if he's obviously offsides and the Chiefs are still sticking to their guns between Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes, both, you know, throwing a fit on the sideline. Patrick Mahomes was the one throwing the fit on the sidelines. But then both of them making remarks uh, about that call. And it, it just felt like a sore loser reaction to me. Um, but personally, I just I think it makes them look like fools. Uh, and and I, I can't believe how irate they both have been over that call. He was obviously lined up just barely offside, and, and it should have been called personally. Um, but, Jeremy, I don't know if you were able to see that play and see what happened there, but uh, what are your thoughts? I had the opportunity to see it last night. Like I, I thought it was pretty – Pretty different, obviously. We're not we're used to seeing Travis Kelsey in this kind of situation pull pull something out of his hat. But I mean, at the end of the day, what happens has happened. I mean, it's a penalty. I know you obviously lost the game due to the situation and of course the the cameras and everybody just zoomed right on into Patrick Mahomes, like everyone's obviously seen them. Patrick Mahomes, um, I understand there's a fine line between upset and ticked off. Um, he completely shoved those to the core and he went next level and just went ape, you know what. Um, I understand you I understand, like I said, you lost the game, but there's no there's no need to go off like that on prime TV just because I mean you look at a lot of these guys and you see you see kids looking up to Patrick Mahomes or even um, Travis Kelsey or or whoever it is in the NFL, and they see a guy like that. I understand some people will say, oh, that's just him showing heart. But at the end of the day, is that really showing some heart? No, to me that's just showing that it was really ignorant of you just to throw that big of a fit for losing a football game. And the, another thing, I do give some props to Andy Reid for what he did say in the press conference, which was, that Patrick Mahomes did take it too far, and this is not like what we're used to seeing, obviously, Patrick Mahomes doing. And uh, I'll give Andy Reid some props to that, but at the end of the day, you need to you need to man up and just say, well, we lost. Tough. Okay, on the next week. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Blake, how about you? Did you were you able to kind of see the not, not only the just the play, but also, if, of course, the reaction? I mean, like I said, personally, I just felt like, it kind of made you look very immature to still see what happened and still double down on it and, and stick to your guns. Uh, I feel like him saying that to uh, Josh Allen was a little uncalled for. Like, um, if you want to say it to the media, whatever. But, D- bro, don't, don't look. Don't come up to me and talking about that was a BS call and all this. Like, you lost, bro. Shake the man's hand and keep it moving. All right? I can go ahead and tell you this. Uh, I know a couple quarterbacks that if they would have done that, they would be getting treated completely different right now. But since it's Pat Mahomes, we're just going to sweep it under the rug and we're not going to really talk about it. But I know if a couple other guys would have done that, all right, and I know one guy that went to, uh, you know, Auburn University right here, if he was still in the league and he would have acted like that, um, he would have got uh, absolutely blasted, probably out of the league. Um, so I do. Th- I'm with you. I think it was very immature of him to act like that. Like, look, Kadarius Tony, he was all sides. Like, right. I don't know what. I don't know what more you like. What do you keep arguing? Well, and his his remarks in the press conference were something along the lines of, you know, I, for him to make that call, knowing that it didn't change the outcome of of the play. I, I get it. That's why I think it's it's silly when you see how how minor of a call it is, but it's still the rule. You know, he's still lined up, and that's that's kind of yeah. where I stand. Uh, and I can think of a guy uh, to kind of add to that, a guy from uh, that came from Oklahoma that was kind of along the same lines too. Uh, that's that, a fact. That they would definitely scrutinize if he were to act that way. But uh, let's, let's jump to one more thing before uh, we get too far, uh, or I guess before we pretty much close it up. But uh, we, we had the debut from Bronny James. LeBron James' son shows up on the court. 
and I kept on getting notifications left and right about Bronny James's uh, debut. He comes into the game, and I saw all of these big things. I'm thinking, well, he must be he, he must be coming in there to be a game changer. And he comes in, he goes one for three, hits a three pointer. That was it. Uh, and so I thought the the fuss over all of this was kind of a bit much. And then on top of that, they end up losing to Long Beach State, eighty four to seventy nine, in final overtime. Mm. I, I mean, guys, I, I just. It, it's it's very similar to, to other other times that we've seen. We I think we've even talked about a few others where you know you, you hype something up so much that's just not worth being hyped up. Uh, and and it, man, it was just it, it's one of those things. Kind of like Aaron Judge, uh, you know, I, I, not not to pick on you, Blake, but Aaron Judge hitting that home run record doesn't mean anything to me when I'm watching my Oklahoma Sooners play football on TV. So stop showing showing it and and taking over my game and shoving it in my face. Uh, you know, kind of similar to Bronny James. <laughs> Don't make such a big deal about something and shoving it in my face when he ends up just losing and, and, and his team, you know, his team loses and he only hits mm-hmm. one bucket the entire game anyways. Uh, so I just I personally, I saw that. I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, and, you know, I'm not rooting against the kid. Uh, I'm not. But it was just kind of funny. The fact that they make such a big deal out of something that ends up just basically being a flop. I'm with you, man. Look, uh, Auburn plays them Sunday. Uh, and you know, uh, like I'm, I'm proud the kid overcome his health issues and everything and he's getting to play basketball. But I, at the end of the day, I'm just kind of tired of hearing about it for real. Like, um, I get he's LeBron's son, but, um, you know, I, it is what it is. You know, uh, he, he's, he's a kid playing college basketball. Um, I don't think he had near the height that his dad had. So like, I'm not really like on the follow train like I was with his dad. So it's it's just not like a huge deal to me. Yeah, and, and, and Jeremy, I, I will say like one thing. It was really sweet. There was a highlight of him, and it it, it was a little nostalgic, I guess. Uh, maybe, that, maybe that's what you would say. Uh, but it was kind of a sweet moment because we saw him run down the court. I think it was the first play he was in, run down the court and have a, da- you know, a moment like his dad and deflect a ball off the backboard. That was really sweet to see. I'm excited to see him play. And, and I'm glad that he's better from some of the hard issues that he had. Um, but just l- maybe a little too much hype. Yeah. And I was actually thinking the exact same thing right before you mentioned it, Josh. Just, it's, I know, obviously, if I correct me if I'm wrong, I think the announcer said that, oh, his daddy would only do that on one leg and he only did it on two. Well, give him some time <laughs> here. But I mean, um, the, to me, I'm just, when I heard that, I'm like, who cares what his dad does? This is his moment, and this is his time mm-hmm. to prove to, prove to everybody what he's made of. It's not about what daddy can do. It's what he can do. This, this isn't his basketball career that he's trying to lead himself down. This is his. And I, I, I'm also on the same lines. I do I do love the fact that he's taking care of himself and his ment- his health ability is back to normal. I do love seeing that aspect. Just because I know we were all, everybody was obviously really excited to see him get on the court finally and and uh, and get, just even play. And I mean, you may have not scored, you may not have dropped like a forty bomb, but I mean, I mean, I understand you only dropped not one bucket in, but. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, it's cool to see you put some points on the board. Well, I mean points, I mean singular point. But um, looking at the overall expectation for it, it so let's just see what he can do. And I just we I wish him nothing but the best, and just keep your head up, bud, because you got a lot of road to you got a lot of road to take care of. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and one thing to kind of bring up in college basketball, that's. The one thing I will miss about the Big 12, the Big 12 conference in basketball this year, guys, is looking mighty mm. feisty. Uh, Oklahoma's looking really good. I think they're ranked number 11 right now. Uh, and the thing, last time I checked, too, I think there was like five different teams in the Big 12 that are ranked in the top 25. So it's it's a fun year in college basketball. And I, from the little bits I've been able to catch on different tournaments and stuff, I've been tuning in. And, and it's, it's a fun year. We're definitely going to have to dive more into it, especially since we're going to have a little bit of a break from – college uh, college football getting into college basketball we're definitely gonna have to dive more into that but guys that's all we've got for you today uh, we thank you all so much for watching listening if you're watching on youtube please hit that subscribe button help us out we keep on growing and it's all because of you guys so hit that subscribe button you can follow us on social media you can find us on x instagram uh, facebook all of all of that fun stuff so please go show us some love over there as well i'd love to grow our presence on social media and it takes you to do that 
Uh, and then if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, you can always share it with a friend, but you can also give us a five-star review. That is the best way to help us out over on all of those podcast platforms. And if you don't have a review option on the podcast platform that you listen to, you can go over to our website, rising2.com. That's R-I-S-I-N-G-T-O.com and give us a review over there as well. Guys, we thank you so much for listening and tuning in with us. And until next time.